in the truck. And it was full of road signs which basically said no entry, martial law. Now that is the same story that I have received from the state of Michigan. A similar type thing happened in the state of Washington where a, another similar thing like uh, is reported to have happened like that. Um, the story, of course, and all this is something that I haven't seen personally, and so I'm just relaying it. So you might stay alert if you see anything like that in your area. Uh, it'd be fun if you let me know. Marga Dirksen from Kansas there calls me every once in a while when she sees all these uh, uh, convoys going by out there in that area. She's on a kind of a north-south uh, area road going up to Fort Riley and that sort of thing. Rail, rather strange, but it's kind of nice to keep up on things like that. You get back here and uh, get uh, wired, uh, uh, please, fellas. Anyway, I thought you might be interested in, in those little things and keep aware and be aware. One of our uh, ladies, uh, Polly Katie, has been crisscrossed around Colorado several uh, times and has seen a number, uh, two or three at least, two or three places that are potential uh, concentration camps or uh, as some people have referred to, gun-free camps where you can live without a gun and you can be shielded from those people that do have guns and live inside those fences and, uh, and uh, have, uh, you know, maybe one meal a day. Uh, but there are, out there in the mountains, there are a number of things if you can get into the back roads that are kind of interesting to see. I, I think I mentioned that Richard Boylan is uh, re seemingly recuperated and the, uh, uh, quite well, although his doctor said he didn't want him flying out of here today, so we're trying to make arrangements for him to do that tomorrow. And as nearly as I can tell from what they've told me is that all of a sudden it wasn't necessarily a heart attack, it's when his blood pressure dropped to zero or whatever. Has anybody out here ever had that happen to him and does that simulate a heart attack? Uh, yeah, that is uh, what's reported to me. I think most of, oh, we're going. <clears throat> Phyllis Schlemmer of Flagler Beach, Florida, is our next speaker. This is the first time she's been with us as a speaker, also at Global Sciences. Most of the summer, she was all over uh, Europe, here and there, speaking here and there, and doing whatever uh, else she was doing over there. So we are fortunate uh, that she could be back just a short time ago and be with us because she speaks uh, and teaches in a lot of places. <coughs> Originally, I had been told of her as being an excellent astrologer, psychic, and medium. But her choice was at that time, at the time we put the, co uh, the co program together to speak on her topic conversations with the nine. Now the nine, the nine what? That's going to what, what she will tell you or what she will uh, elucidate on some more today if she wishes. Otherwise if she thinks there's something more current and more appropriate that we should hear about, she has our permission to go ahead and do that. So we're pleased to produce or present, I should say, Phyllis Schlemmer, will you welcome her this afternoon, please? Thank you. You want that one? It doesn't matter. Thank oh, you very much. Oh, you're much, wired Steve. anyway. Okay. I'm wired, yeah. Okay. It's a great honor for me to be here, and I want to thank Global Science and Dean and Phyllis for inviting me. Um, there's only one or two people here that I have known from the past. And uh, so I'm a bit nervous. Not many of you, but not any of you know who I am or what I do. So I will briefly explain to you something about who I am and how I got to be 
doing the work that I'm doing. Um, I'm 70 years old. At the age of five, I was raised, first of all, I should say, by two grandmothers, one an Italian Jew and the other an Irish Roman Catholic. <laughs> my father was Irish Roman Catholic and my mother was an Italian Jewess. So the Jews claimed me because it comes from the mother and the Catholics claim me because it comes from the father. Um, when I was about nine months old, my mother was very ill, so my Irish grandmother took me to raise me, and the agreement was that in the winters I was with her, and in the summer I was with my Jewish grandmother. Both of these women were top clairvoyants, psychics, mediums, whatever term you want to use. My Irish grandmother would take me into the cemetery looking for mushrooms and teach me about the nature spirits. As I saw them, she would explain to me who they were, what they were, what they were doing. I also saw at that time a lot of other spirits in the cemeteries and I didn't understand why when I would run up to play with them, I could go through them. So we, got, we used to play games. I would run around the tombstones and I would try to catch them. And my grandmother explained to me that these were people who had passed on and they needed help. We would sit and we would pray and tell them to go on and so forth. And she explained a lot of things about how guilt from the family or the desire of the family to hold them would hold them earthbound. And I'm going back 65 years ago. We didn't have a problem with drugs 65 years ago, so it wasn't that some of them were attached to the earth from drugs. We may have had a little bit of problems with the Irish in drinking, as my grandfather had. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't the same kind of energy as we have lately with the, with the earthbounds. It was mostly those souls whose their religion didn't explain to them what death was. They weren't prepared to know, see, feel, and know everything. They all thought when they passed on, they were going to go into a deep sleep or wherever it was going, and maybe in a thousand years there would be a resurrection. Some of them didn't even believe that. So therefore, when they passed on and they were still hanging around, they believed they were alive and physical. Of course, they were alive in their spiritual body. Then my Italian grandmother, she would take me in the summers, and she would teach me about to read oils. She taught me about the Kabbalah. She came from a family of Kabbalists. She was a strong disciplinarian. She taught me the ethics and responsibility of this thing that I had. Now my father and my mother both came from very large families and they were both the eldest in their family and neither one of them wanted to accept what their parents or their, their mothers were. Because you have to know in those days, they were, uh, they had come from Europe. They wanted to be American. So they didn't want the old ways. They didn't want to know anything about the old ways. And not any of their children had this ability. Now they may have had it, but if they did, they suppressed it. So my two grandmothers were delighted that he, I was the eldest in our family, that here along came someone who had these abilities and wanted to do something with them. But it got me into trouble. Constantly I was in trouble with it. I would pop up and say things. When people would say to my, would tell my grandmother a story. As an example, my grandfather loved to go to Finnegan's Bar. And uh, we would go down the hill at night. We lived on top of a hill, and in the evening, we would go down to Finnegan's and bring my grandfather home. My grandmother was a very big, tall, raw-boned woman. She was the most wonderful human being I ever knew. Um, and she just was filled with love all the time. She had this great big shawl. She'd pick me up, wrap me in the shawl. Down the hill we'd go, and we would bring my grandfather home. And she would say to Finnegan, now, how many drinks did you get, let him have? And Finnegan would say, oh, Mary, he only had one. And I'd say, he's lying, Grandma. He's lying. That's not the truth, because I would see all this kind of energy. It took years for them to convince me to keep my mouth shut. My mother always said, your mouth will get you in trouble, because no matter, sometimes I couldn't help myself. I would just blurt it out. Well, when it came time to go to school, 
I was raised in a Pennsylvania town, population 600. My father was the only Catholic. My mother was the only Jewish. Not only that, she was an Italian, so therefore she was a Wapkike, as they called her. And my father was a Mick. And the school board made a decision that my brother and I could not go to school with their children because we would contaminate them. This was allowed in those days. Today it would not be. And it was a really strong Protestant community that did not accept anything that was Catholic or anything that was Jewish. So we were sent off to a Catholic school. And in that Catholic school, and another thing I have to regress, and I was born with a attached tongue. So I had a lisp. And I was sent to this wonderful nun to teach me elocution so I could speak correctly. I still lisp a little. And she and I became very, very close. She was just absolutely wonderful. I loved her. And she was a teacher in this Catholic school that I went to. We were in trouble all the time, my brother and I. My parents were in the hotel business. And on Saturday nights, sometimes business was booming. So they didn't get to bed till 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, which meant they didn't get up to take us to Mass on Sunday. And the first thing that would be asked on Monday morning is, who did not go to Mass on Sunday? And of course, we told the truth. We put up our hands. And my brother went along with me in the, in the same grade. That uh, he was 11 months younger. And then the nuns would start telling us how terrible our mother was. She was a killer of Christ, and she did this, and she did that. And that's why we weren't going to school. When I was about eight, this still was going on. And this one nun said to me, your mother is a pagan. You're, she's causing you to commit mortal sins. You're going to die and you're going to go to hell. And I turned to her and I said, God's going to punish you. That is not true. That afternoon, that nun fell in front of the church and began to foam at the mouth as she was trying to go into the church and she fell down and she was jerking and foaming at the mouth and so forth. And one of the nuns said to me, you put the devil in her. You caused her to have the devil in her. This frightened me so much to think that I was so bad that I had the ability to put the devil in somebody that I didn't speak to anybody for years. I was afraid to open my mouth. Now, the priests knew that I could see. They knew that I could see things that nobody else could see. So they would come to me when there was a problem in the community that needed what they considered an exorcism or to see if it was such a thing that needed an exorcism, to see if there were spirits around. So they would take me. And oftentimes, I was the eyes for the exorcisms. These were all done quietly. It wasn't something that was ever advertised. And, so the, and the nuns resented also that the priest would come and they'd say, we want to take Phyllis with us. They never said to the nuns what they were doing, but I'm sure that the nuns knew. And I would go merrily along my way. I liked it. I got out of school. And I would see all these, these things that were going on. But after this incident happened, I was so frightened to say anything. And the priest still came for me. And they said I was safe when I was with them. And that felt good for me. And then when I was about 12 years old, Mary, the, Sister Mary DeSales is the, woman, is the nun that taught me to speak. She had left the school and had been sent to another school. And she came back as the mother superior to this school that I was, ne that I was in. And when she saw me walking around with my head down and not speaking, she asked me what was wrong. And I told her. And she said to me, child, you did not put the devil. It had nothing to do with you. That sister had an epileptic seizure. And it was such a relief for me, but it still it left me with, I guess I was kind of traumatized with it. And as I got older and I was trained by my grandmothers, my one grandmother worked with me in trance, 
They taught me so many things and so many ways of being with this ability that I had. And the most important thing that they taught me is you have to get an education. Because nobody's going to believe anything that you're saying, and you've got to support yourself. And therefore, the best thing that you can do is to have an education. And my mother, by the time she was, when I was 12, my mother became an invalid with arthritis. And I knew that it had a lot to do with the way she thought and with the foods that she ate. So I decided that what I wanted to be was a nutritionist. So I went on to get a degree, degree in nutrition. Later on, I got a PhD in nutrition. Um, I also got a degree in business administration because I loved business. I loved the challenge of it. I was raised in it. And to support myself, and I got married, and I had two wonderful daughters. And after my second daughter was born, I became pregnant again. And I was married to a man. We were in business. We were in, in the milk business at the time. We used to have all kinds. I was in the restaurant business. I was in the milk business. I, I mean, I've been in so many businesses. I was a private detective. Uh, I, I just, I mean, there were so many things. I owned a boat company. I owned a salvage company. I'll talk about that with the dolphins later. Anyway, and I'm telling you all this so you know how I got to where I, I am. And um, when I was, there's my, my youngest daughter. She must have been, yeah, she was born in October of 52. And in December of 52, I nursed her. And I had a habit. I was a smoker. And so I would have a habit of getting up in early in the morning, nursing her, putting her back in her crib. And I lived in a three-building uh, complex. It was one of the first high-rises in that area. And I lived on the top floor. So I would go out every morning, early, early in the morning, as the sun was coming up, have my coffee and my cigarette before my day started. And there I looked out, and there was this strange ship or something in the center of these three buildings, high rises. And I looked at that. And I looked around, and I noticed that there were people on the roofs. And they, because people used to go up there before they would go to work to have a cup of coffee. It was in the winter, but it was also, it had a cover on at the top. And we began to call across to each other. Everyone was afraid to go get a camera. They were afraid they would miss something. And we watched it. And it must have been, I would assume, between 15 and 20 minutes. I was fascinated with it. And it moved like this. And suddenly, it went up, and it was gone. Well, of course, everybody ran for the telephone to notify the police. The next thing we knew, and this was a building, an apartment house that most of the people in it were in business. There were lawyers, there were doctors, and business people. The next thing we knew, there was a lot of knocks on our doors. And we were calling it the UFOs, the UFO. And they would come and they would ask, are you sure that you saw what you think you saw? It wasn't a hallucination. Well, over a period of time, all of the other people, because they also went to our neighbors. They went to my neighbor who crossed the, across the way from me, who she also thought I was a little mashuga anyway, a little crazy, um, wanted to know where, was I in trouble financially, and did I have a boyfriend when my husband was at work, and things of this nature. And eventually, everybody said, no, they guess they didn't see it. And I was the, the last holdout on it. And it was like clockwork. Almost every week, I could be sure someone was going to knock on my door and ask me. And I said, yes, I saw it. Well, these other people didn't say it. They thought they saw it, but they think now that maybe it was a, a gas balloon, or it was an illusion, or it was something with the sun coming down, or this, and things of this nature. I said, look, I know what I saw. And they also saw that I was pregnant, because I was pregnant with my third child now, by, by this time. 
as they would come knocking on my door. March, April, May. And one night I went into labor and was rushed to the hospital and I delivered a little boy stillborn at seven and a half months. The following week I came out of the hospital. They came to my door again and looked at me and said, are you sure you saw a UFO? Oh, by the way, Phyllis, I see you had a, your baby. What did you have? I said, I had a son and he passed on. And they said, well, it's too bad, but are you sure you saw a UFO? And I said, no, I guess I didn't. So those were my experiences in the beginning. Later on, I opened up a center, and I was the first in Florida, and it took a long time to get the, the city and the county and the state to permit me to have a center that was not affiliated with a religion. And the reason I did that is that I felt that my ability had nothing to do with my belief system. And the spiritualist church went against me they tried everything possible to stop me from being licensed and being allowed to have a center. I, at that time, was not a member of the spiritualist church. I was an Irish Catholic Jew, and I didn't have anything to do, didn't actually believe in some of the tenets that they believed in the nationalist spiritualist. At that time, they didn't believe in reincarnation. I knew there was such a thing. Because when I was five years old, my grandfather passed on, whom I dearly loved, and his name was Tom. And when he died, he passed on at home. My aunts asked me to come downstairs and to say goodbye to him. And when I walked into the bedroom, there was this gigantic doll on the bed. And my grandfather was a big man. And I couldn't understand, what is this doll doing on the bed? He's standing right alongside of the bed. And I said to him, Pop, Pop, what's this? And he said, nothing. I said, but why would they make such a big doll like this? Child, don't worry about it. And then they did the most marvelous thing. They brought in somebody, because at that time they didn't have funeral homes, not at least where I came from, and they brought in this red velvet drapes and these brass bars and they hung these red velvet drapes and they brought in this beautiful box with this white satin and they put this big doll inside. And I would creep down the stairs at night and I would climb into the coffin and I would try to get this doll out. I wanted to play with this doll and my grandfather would tell me, you know, just leave it alone. It's not, you know, you can't play with it. It's too heavy. Just, and then he would say, come on, we'll just go play. And in the daytime, he would go outside with me and he would play hopscotch as everybody was coming to the, to the wake. My aunts at the time did not permit me to speak to my grandmother. She was so traumatized by his passing or they thought that I was traumatized and that I couldn't speak to her. And the day of the funeral, as they were taking him out the door, I said to him, Pop, Pop, do you want to go with the doll? And where are they taking the doll? He says, oh, well, they're just taking it somewhere. I said, do you want to go with it? He said, no, I want to stay here and play hopscotch with you. So I remember my uncle picking me up off the sidewalk and moving me over so they could take the coffin out. After that, they spoke to my grandmother and told her that I was so traumatized at the loss of my grandfather that I didn't accept his death. And then she came to me and she said, oh, child, your faith. It's the Irish way of saying you have this sensitive seeing. And she really then took me under her wing and began to develop me. So later on, I used this ability for, I mean, <laughs> I was in the private detective business. I um, had a salvage company and I used to communicate with dolphins. I would swim with the dolphins and I could hear dolphins 35 miles away underwater, about 50 kilometers, 50, 55 kilometers. 
And I had a salvage business during the Cuban Revolution. And these dolphins would lead me right to where the ships had sunk. So we had a very good business going until one of our competitions scuttled our tug. I used to skip trace. I did that for a living. That I liked. I liked to do fun things with it. And I loved it when I could skip trace somebody who was beating a bank or leaving a, 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 somebody owing somebody money, like big companies and jewelry companies and things. I also was in the jewelry business. And I could find by map, by touching the map where the people were, where they were going. I would call up the different police departments in these areas where I thought they were and say, did you see so-and-so going through your town, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would always recover everything. I actually worked at one time with an agent in Miami, Florida, of one of our government agencies, who I won't mention what it is, um, that had the highest recovery of stolen goods. And did you know that the agents got 25% of everything they recovered? I didn't know until he told me. I didn't know that that's what I was helping him do for a long time until one day he told me. So from there, as I said, I opened up an office. I opened an astrology school called Astrology Dynamics of Florida. I was the first licensed. And I was the first, and I'm not bragging, and I am bragging. Um, when I opened up my psychic center, no one with AT&T or Mother Bell, at the time we didn't have all this breakup, could have a listing that said psychic in the yellow pages. You had to be listed under spiritualist. And I did not want to be listed under spiritualist. For me, spiritualist was a religion. And that time, if you were identified as a spiritualist, you were identified as someone in that religion. So I took the telephone company to task. And they said, no, I had to be listed under that. And I said, then I'm not paying you commercial rates for a telephone. If I'm not allowed, and I had worked for the telephone company, skip tracing the mafia for them. So I knew how they worked. And they held me up till the day before the Yellow Pages were to, was to be published. And I said, I'll take you to court, and I'll be my own lawyer, and I'll win. Because I also worked for lawyers. And every lawyer I ever worked for never lost a case. I told them how to do it. I was blessed with this ability. And I earned a living with it primarily in business. I came from a long family of healers, and my healing, and with children especially, we never took money. That was not part of the... We kept our center open by teaching astrology and by doing business consultations. I worked with the police locating bodies. I worked with the Israeli government looking for missing soldiers, because it is so vitally important for the parents to know if, the, if their son or daughter was killed or if they were captured by terrorists or if they were in Jordan or in Syria or wherever. So I did a lot of work using this ability. One day, when I was doing a lecture, and I had a good life. I had a very good life. I had very good income, many friends. I traveled, I lectured, I gave workshops. And one day when I was in, I think it was in Chicago, giving a series of workshops and lectures, Henry Belk happened to be there, and many of you probably know who Henry Belk is. He had the Belk Foundation. He funded 
Dr. Andrea Puharic to go to Brazil to, to investigate Arago, the Brazilian healer. He funded Puharic's work with Peter Herkos, the Dutch psychic who became Reagan's, or Mrs. Reagan's psychic. And Henry happened to be at the lecture. He was visiting someone in Chicago, and he used to come to my center quite often, and we would talk about different things. And he had been telling me about this man named Dr. Puharic, whom one day he wanted me to meet. But he call it, kind of pronounced Andrea's number, name funny. He would call him Porich. So we happened to be sitting in the lounge of a hotel in Chicago when this man came in. And Henry jumped up quick and he said, that's Porich, that's Porich. And he brought him over and he said, hey, Doc, I want you to meet somebody. And that's how I met Dr. Andrea Puharic. And we began to talk. And it was like this was the man that all my life I had been waiting for to give information that I had been holding. Information that my grandmother had given to me, my Jewish grandmother. We sat and we talked for 24 hours nonstop. And what was interesting, he would ask me questions. And I would do 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 He'd ask me this about the Kabbalah, blah, 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 blah. I would just give it out. After I finished with the, with this, excuse me, I need some water. After I finished, to this day, I cannot remember anything that I told him. It was as if all that knowledge that I was carrying in that particular, on that particular subject was given to him, or that's what it was why I carried it, I don't know. It had to do with the Kabbalah. Later on, some other aspects, thank you very much, Philip. Some other aspects of the Kabbalah began to come up that I evidently had not transferred to, uh, to Andrea. So he asked me would I mind working with him, and what I did is every summer when I would do the lecture circuit, at the end of the summer, I would go up to his home in Austining, New York, and I would work with him in a Faraday cage. You all know what a Faraday cage is, I'm sure, right? Well, it's a shielded room, and the one that uh, Puharic had built was all copper. Um, I don't understand the mechanics of any of it and because and, I'm not very scientific, which used to drive him crazy. Uh, but when we had electronic equipment inside the cage, because he would test me with equipment, and when they closed the door, everything would go off. And he, uh, well, from what I understand is there can be no outside interference. And I think that NASA uses Faraday cages for certain work and so forth. I know that when I worked in the cage, my work was different. My way of going in was different. My way of coming out was different. I felt protected. I didn't feel as if I had to be on alert all the time. And I think that the electricity comes into the cage in such a way that it goes through oil of some sort, because I know we had this box that they used to put the electricity through. And everything in it was copper and brass. And the, the cage itself was steel. And then it was covered inside with copper, copper floor, copper roof, uh, ceiling, copper walls. And the cage that we worked in was 7 by 10. And he could get some equipment in there. He used to uh, connect me to all kinds of electrodes and all kinds of machines. And he would test me with different things. So I would spend my, about a month, what time runs very fast. <laughs> I would spend about a month with him and then I would go back to my center. Now, I discovered a, a, a North American Indian healer who healed a third degree burn in eight minutes. Documented, documented, third degree burn in eight minutes. I was so impressed with this healer 
that I called Andrea and I said, Andrea, you need to come. This was after I'd been working with Andrea for quite a few years. I said, you need to come to Florida. You need to meet him. I'm really impressed with him. This was a young man who used to call me up and tell me he was possessed all the time. And incidentally, I did, I did in my lifetime, by myself, without priests, 250-some exorcisms. And he had heard about this. Of all those, only four of them were demonic. The rest were possessions. <coughs> But he had heard about my work, and he had called me up and said that he was possessed. So I went to see him, and I did. I, I, I realized he wasn't possessed at all. He thought he was, but he wasn't. And um, I invited him into my classes. And then one day, he did this third-degree burn in eight minutes. So Andrea came to see this uh, Indian. He was of the Seminole tribe. And we worked with him, and we were hoping to develop him into being a really top-notch healer, but he couldn't deal with the pressures. He had problems with his family. He had problems with his wife. She was kind of, kind of upset that he was getting this attention. She said, why not me? Why, why him? And he was very, um, he began to test God very much. He would... Uh, say he wanted to cure, you know, he would read in the National Enquirer these uh, people who, you know, like one baby was born with three hearts and two livers, and I don't know if it was ever true, it was in the in Enquirer, and he would say, those are the only ones I want to heal. And if somebody even took an aspirin, he wouldn't touch them. And he began to be quite difficult to work with. We, had a, we invested a lot of time in him, and we invested a lot of money in him. Puharich raised money so he could give him income to support his family so he didn't have to work. I was helping him to support him, and finally we had to give up on him. And it was uh, one day Puharich said to me, Phyllis, I want you to go into your altered state, and I want to find out what we need to do about him and how to handle him. And when I went in, Puharich talked to this entity that gave his name as Tom. Not Tom, but Tom. But we got to calling him Tom. And this was an entity, I used to teach uh, mediumship, and I taught a class in trance. And I had uh, 16 or 17 students. And my students were taught by a spirit teacher named Dr. Fisk. And Dr. Fisk, we proved who he was eventually and who he had, had been and so forth. And one day this other entity came in and said to my student, uh, Dr. Fisk says there's somebody else coming and they want to speak to the students. And he came in, he introduced himself as Tom. He, they told me later that he spoke of universal things. And I used to have a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder outside of my door. And as we um, communicated, I had somebody who would turn it on with a remote control. And when they told me about this particular uh, spirit, they called him, we wa wanted to listen to him after the session, and there was no way of hearing him. You could hear Dr. Fisk saying he was coming in. You would hear 20 minutes of blank tape. Then you would hear Dr. Fisk speak again. 20 minutes, nothing. My students were, said that he came in and he told them A, B, C, D. I told them a lot of things. They loved him very much. He was very gentle. He was very kind. He was very universal. And he told a lot of history of the planet. So I, this went on for three or four weeks. And then finally I said to them, look, enough is enough because I'm a great challenger. You tell him if he doesn't let us record him, we're not gonna, I'm not going to work anymore. And they said to him, why can't we record you? And he said, you didn't ask permission, did you? And they asked permission that night, and from then on, he's been recorded. When I went to Israel to live, and I lived there for the last 20-some years, um, I found out that Tom means innocence. It's a Hebrew word that means innocence. And this being communicated with Dr. Puharich for still going on. Puharich has passed on, but the work is still going on. The book, The Only Planet of Choice, came out of 40,000 pages of transcripts that we had. I had to reduce it to about 400. And he has talked about everything that you could possibly imagine. They asked questions. Heads of state have sat with him. 
scientist, there's a young scientist today who started sitting with him when he was 12 years old. Today he's the head of a laboratory. He's won prizes worldwide for his work. I cannot say his name. He's asked because he's still working and does not want to be disrupted. Um, he's recently published a book on his investigation into magnetic energies. Uh, he's been funded by um, the German government with some of his work and also by the United States government with some of his work. But he knows where all of his information came from and how to go about proving a lot of the things that he's been able to prove. He also is very much involved in DNA uh, investigation and, and understanding and structure. He's working on new coding of DNA. All of this came out of Tom, his direction on how to go. Uh, Tom has told us things 25 years ago that everybody said was absolutely crazy, couldn't be. 20 years later, proven that it was right. He's given the history of humankind, how it came to be. The most important thing that he has conveyed that I think I would like to convey to you and that Dr. Puharich was attempting to convey. And you know, Puharich was, really had problems with the government. And in the book, if any of you do have the book, Andrew is Dr. Puharich because he asked us to use the name Andrew. He had had enough, by the time the book came out, he had had enough with what the government had done to him. He passed on with a very unfortunate death. We'll never know the truth. Um, he's a great loss and I miss him very much. But I'm hoping to carry on with trying to get the message across that he was trying to get across. And that is that we, and the book is called The Only Planet of Choice, and the reason it's called that is Tom said that this planet is the only planet of individual choice. All other civilizations and all other planets are a collective consciousness. It's one planet with one collective consciousness and those beings there agree to be in that collective consciousness. We are the closest anywhere in the universe created in the image of the creator. Now you can make the creator whatever you want, whether it's creative energy, whatever. I prefer, I always like the term God. I'm happy with that. And I'm also happy with seeing God as a, a man with a gray long white beard sitting on a throne. That, that suits me. And I also know that it's infinite intelligence. Tom said that we have the ability, and there were some speakers who have picked up on this, but we were the first ones, Tom was the first one to come out with this information that we contain within us the ability to bring change with just a small group of people. We don't need a lot of people, but we have to have, he said with 12 people you can move mountains. And I would, bring, how many minutes do I have, Ken? 15 minutes and 45 seconds, 15 minutes and 45 seconds okay. Huh? I'll give you an incident that he asked us to do. He asked me to go to Israel to live. I went there. I gave up my practice. I gave up my family. I gave up everything and moved there. And from someone who had everything, I went to someone who had nothing to carry on this work. From someone who was earning $150,000 a year and going back in the 60s and 70s, a woman earning $150,000 a year, that was a heck of a lot of money to someone that was living on six to $800 a month for the next 20 years. That was really a bit difficult. But when I was in Israel, if you all remember the Skylab, and Uri Geller had, what, 20, 000, 20 million people on, tele, on the radio meditating at noon one day to try to throw it back. And that was the first time this kind of meditation was done all over the world and the Skylab didn't go back. 
There was a consensus at one time by scientists that it was going to come down in Israel. So my group asked Tom, what do we do? And where can it come down? Where will it come down? And Tom said, you get 12 together. But this time, they have to be 12 Jews. The sitters asked Tom, why Jews? And he said, because no two Jew will have the same opinion. And believe me, I lived in Israel over 20 years, 20, near 25 years, just on principle, you will not get them to agree. It's really a, funny to live there and see how they will switch in midstream just so they don't have to agree with the person sitting next to them. <laughs> and they will challenge you on everything. It was such a shock to me to come back to the States and have an audience that didn't challenge me. Because there, you know, I could say something and someone would jump up and say to me, how do you know that? Prove that. They do this to professors in the colleges. American professors would get a little bit crazy with the way they behave. But they get, they learn, they have this desire to know the young Israelis, and, and they're a delight. But he, this is what he told us. So we, my husband and I, interviewed and interviewed and interviewed because Tom said it also had to be People that would not ever tell what they did until they were told they could. Now that's a difficult one. It had to be someone that would let go of their ego. We asked, how will we know if we succeeded? And when I say we, it's not me. I have no memory of what I'm doing. I have no recollection. I, I, my whole body shuts down. When I go into a situation with, with Tom, my entire body shuts down. I've been in cases where I've nearly died. And if it wasn't for Puharch being a medical doctor and being with me, he saved my life many times. One time in Jerusalem, he was pretty sure I wasn't going to come out of it. And he brought me out. So the sitters were asking, and they said, if you are successful, it will come down. And they gave the longitude and latitude of where it would come down and that no one would be hurt. So we began the round the clock. Well, we finally found 12. Well, we only needed to find 10 because it was my husband and myself. So we found 10 more, and we began the meditations. And it came down exactly where Tom said it would come down and no one was hurt. And we then began to realize the power and none of those people, not one of those individuals ever told that they were involved in such a meditation because they could have gone out and been very, you know, exuberant that this had happened. And it was only a few years ago that we were allowed to talk about it. And we have seen many miracles happen with just 12 people. And Tom has said to always meditate in groups of three. And we have worldwide meditations every Sunday at 9 o'clock Israeli time, which is 2 o'clock in um, Eastern time. So I don't know, I'm always mixed up with these time zones. So it's like 11 o'clock here. It's 2, 2 p.m. in the U.S. And, and Eastern time. And even in daylight time it's the same because Israel changes its daylight time at the same time we change ours. It's a seven hour difference in Eastern time so it would be a nine hour difference here. Being noon here. And I didn't meditate today, I have to tell you that. But we have people in every country, and they're meditating for the trees of the world, for the government leaders of the world, uh, for peace in the world. And they say, wherever three come together, you set up a triad of really powerful energy. But if tr three can't come together, then sit at home and mind connect with someone else if you can. 
and you'll find the energy working. We meditate for 36 minutes. 18 minutes is for the uh, replenishing of the oxygen and the saving of the uh, rainforest and cleaning of the waters of the earth. And then the next 18 minutes is for the world leaders and for the peoples in the poor country and, and etc. And this is going. This has been going on for over 20 years now. Uh, I'm going to open it to questions because I could talk about so many different things and uh, probably have lost, uh, you know, have given you just tops of uh, pieces of information, and you may have some questions. And before I do that, I do have some books uh, back there on. on um, table 42, but I need you to know that the uh, first edition of the book was, is, my book was published by Gateway Publishers from London, from England. It's not my book, it's our book. Um, and the first edition was with a, their editor was Paladin Jenkins. He added some comments to it. I was not so happy that he had added comments because I wanted Tom just to speak. And that with Tom just speaking, is now out of print. It's being, it's, I think it's its seventh printing. And I do have some copies of the Paladin, uh, my, Mine with Paladin. And um, the thing about this particular version, which was the first edition, and only 5,000 of these were printed, uh, is that they've become collector's items. Because Paladin does give some commentaries that have a lot of validity. I felt some of them also didn't, so I was a bit nervous about that. And anybody who does have the book would have to make their own judgment. And I prefer people to think, to understand what Tom said themselves. So if there's any questions, I'm available for questions. I, oh, I have eight minutes left? Okay. Um, let's see, what else? I need, where, what, what did I leave out? <laughs> I'm now back in the States. I came back in the States and, oh, uh, we also worked with Geller. And Puharich, of course, worked with Geller. And I, I need to tell you this. There's a book coming out now that was published just in July. Someone FedExed me a copy, what we say in Hebrew, chick chuck, and it's actually a uh, Hebrew word means quickly. The first time I heard it, I thought it was a slang word, but it's not. Uh, faxed me Chick Chuck a um, copy of the book, and it's an attack on um, Hoagland, an attack on uh, her um, Hertak, an attack. Oh, they call me Puharich and Sir John Whitmore the most insidious, dangerous people on the planet. I just want you to know that you've just met the most insidious, dangerous person on the planet. Um, they claim Puharich was a CIA agent, and I can validate that he was not. I lived with Puharich in the laboratory and with Sir John Whitmore for years as we went around the world doing things. Um, I didn't live live with him, but I lived as a, a colleague in, in the same compound. I know that the end of his days was made very miserable by what they've done to him, what was done to him. His house was burned down. Our home was burned down in Austin, New York. Well, not to the ground, but it was burned down with people in it. There were people living in it. Fortunately, uh, they were not uh, hurt. I personally, myself, we did the Iceland conference. And when the books were published in the Iceland conference, we had our agents in the KGB. And the reason that was done in Iceland is that we were hoping that we wouldn't have many people around like that. When I got back to Israel, I was living in Haifa. And I was living 187 steps in the air. And my cottage was the top one. And one day, and we, we only had one car then. And because uh, cars in those days were very difficult in Israel. They were like 250% taxes. So we had kind of a clunker, and my husband went out with the car. So I was on my deck upstairs, because everything looked over the Mediterranean. And I see these two guys. And I see them looking then th where our car should have been, and it wasn't there. And they start up the steps. And they're coming up and coming up. And as they come up, I notice they passed everybody's house. And they come to mine. And they take out keys. And they open the door, and with this, I creep down the stairs. And the stairs have a wall on them. And they had to come up three stairs to get into 
the first level, our, our cottage was three levels, to the first level. And as I got up to that first level, I came out and I yelled, boo. These, they jumped like this and they ran out. And I went behind them and I said, what are you doing here? Who are you? And they said, oh, this is the Cohen's house, isn't it? I said, no, it's not the Cohen's house. And you know it's not. You had a key to this house. What are you doing here? And they ran. Later on, I moved to a little town called Karkur, Pardishana. I still have a home in Pardishana. And I was living in the Karkur section. My husband was overseas. I had a clinic in Tel Aviv. I went, came home one night at 10 o'clock at night. I had seven dogs. All my dogs were locked in the kitchen. All the lights in the place were on. I go into my house, and my living room is filled with tobacco, ashtrays overflowing. They had gotten into my cupboards. They had, it had um, sunflower seeds, shells all over, nuts seeds and shells all over. All my files out, files all over the place. I just looked at the mess, let my dogs out, went to bed and said, I'll deal with it in the morning. The next morning, I called a friend who I knew had some connections. And I said, all I want to know is, were they my people or your people? So he called me back, and he said, they were your people, meaning it was the CIA. And I said, but why did they leave such a mess? He said, well, the truth is, it was our people that was hired by the CIA, and they wanted you to know. Yes. Can I have my mic on? Hello. Oh, you brought up the subject, and this was just handed to me within the last hour or so from the uh, uh, internet, and it's attacking you. Yeah. And uh, you brought up the subject, and I wondered. I don't even know what it says. I haven't read it, but maybe you have. No, I haven't. I really haven't. Read. Okay. Yeah. It's the people who published it is Lynn Pickett and Clive Prince, The Sinister Origins of the Nine. They're after uh, so many people. Um, She's mentioned in this uh, yeah, they, at some point. Yeah, I, well, they, you know. And uh, I'm wondering. It's called the Stargate C Conspiracy. And Roddenberry, incidentally, Gene Roddenberry lived with us for a while. Deep Space Nine, the beginning of Deep Space Nine came out of our work. He, uh, he agreed not to use anything in any of his uh, Star Trek series without our permission. And after he died, his wife, Majel, got into his notes, and she just took it upon herself to use the title Deep Space Nine, because Gene asked them, where do you come from? And they said, we come from Deep Space. And... Um, well, you may... You may see this on, uh, on your internet that's uh, attacking uh, her and uh, Andrea Poharich. A lot of you people remember Andrea from uh, speaking for us in years past. And uh, since you broached the subject and said you had been attacked, I thought, right. well, this is another Thank you very one much. of those that Yeah, uh, I really has appreciate it. Um, one minute, okay. We have a question for one minute. Do you have a question? Yeah. Would you, uh, are we invited to participate in the meditation group, even if we're, you know? Absolutely. And, and if so, would you go into just slightly more detail with the time that's left? Uh, yes, and then I would also like to read Tom's prayer to close. Um, the meditation is 18 minutes. It's um, it, or, or 36 minutes. The first 18 minutes, you get, in, to get a, a plan of the world, and then see, you choose from which country you're going, and you circle the planet, and especially in those countries where the rainforests are in danger and rivers are polluted, and go through the whole world, seeing it being cleaned up, giving the energy, your loving energy to it, connecting with all the beings that are doing it. You have to get into knowing who are the leaders of these countries that are creating all kinds of problems with their citizens and the dictators and so forth, and then work with them um, in, in the next 18 minutes. Well, the last three minutes, if you have anybody that needs a healing or anything, uh, you can include that. We do ask, uh, my time's up. That, yeah, uh, if, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, doing a that workshop cuts it off. Tomorrow, so, um, that kind of cuts our water off here, and uh, sorry the time is up, but uh, 
I'm sure she'd be happy to talk with you. Yes, I'm about available. That. You can come and ask me anything. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you. I didn't just thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody here that lives close to Winfield, Kansas? Do I see a hand back there? Can you come up and see me uh, as soon as we break here? Um, uh, that brings up another thing that has just been revealed to me, and I, we, we like to have the truth out, regardless of where it falls. Um, and I've just been given what's, what looks to be very authentic documentation that Fritz Springmeier is not who he says he is. A totally different person, uh, and it's, it's pretty shocking and kind of disturbing. If you have heard him before, then you know who I'm talking about. If you haven't and you don't know who he is, well, you don't need to be concerned about it. But uh, more will come out of that, and I'd like to investigate it further, but it looked pretty, uh, pretty serious or pretty authentic to me. All right, be back here in eight minutes because we got some of what I think is the more exciting information to uh, share with this conference.